Uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, we get a couple things out of the way before we start. <coughs> Mike asked me to mention specifically uh, what is going on with us. So uh, I have kidney failure, and I've been on dialysis for about a year and two months now. And uh, last August, they were getting ready to see if I qualified for a kidney transplant. They did some routine tests, and they said, uh, Bill, you have a mental cell lymphoma. So I said, that's cancer, right? And she said, yeah. So they took me, <laughs> took me off the transplant list, and. Uh, uh, put me on chemo, and then we finished the main part of that, and now it's a maintenance thing of every two months for a full day in Boston. That's going to go for two years. So I appreciate your prayers, and uh, I guess enough about that. And then also, before we start, uh, our brother Greg Mergian asked me to make sure, um, or convey to me the, that they, he would love to be remembered to you all. Uh, he has fond memories uh, from a lot of you that go back in the day, like Bill and Debbie Kretta and Mike and Maria O'Connor and others, uh, John Jubak. So uh, uh, Greg says hello. He would be here today, but he's speaking at a church in, in Jersey. But his lo lovely wife, Arpy, and his daughter, Lauren, are here. So if you get a chance to say hello to them. So without any further ado, we're going to see if this contraption works. And uh, if it does, we'll be off to the races, as they say. Uh, there are a lot of things that I can talk to you about this morning. Uh, many issues of the day that are important. But um, I think the most important thing I can speak to you about today is an issue of blood. So if you have your Bible, can you turn please to Luke chapter 8? Luke chapter 8. <coughs> And we're going to uh, be introduced to a dear lady who I believe we'll see in heaven, and I can't wait, can't wait, to, can't wait to talk to her. But it's always good, what they think, it's always good to uh, know the context. It's always good to know the context of what you're talking about. So the context here is, uh, uh, most of you will remember a, a story when the Lord Jesus Christ got out of a boat. He was in the, an area called the Gadarenes. And he met a demon-possessed man there. And the man was possessed with so many demons that when he asked his name, he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he cast the demons out. You remember the story, and they went into a herd of swine and the swine family. And the, the folks that were taking care of the pigs ran into town and told everybody, and they all came out, and they found this demon-possessed man who had previously uh, used to cut himself on the rocks. Uh, he had run around here with his clothes off. They would try to chain him. They the chains off. It was furious demon possession. And they, they came out to the area, and they saw this man, and the text says they found him fully clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and in his right mind. And if you care to read more about that, it's the previous verses in, in Luke chapter 8. And the reaction of these people blows me away. You would think they would rejoice, right? They asked Jesus to leave. Can you get out of here, please? They, they were afraid. So he gets back into the boat, and now the way this setup is, I think you have to use a little imagination to catch the setup. Um, and you know, nowadays we have texting and everything, so somebody can just text the message in and you know, everybody in the world knows it. But let's just pretend that some incredible event happened right outside on the street here. And it was just an amazing thing involving a couple of people. And it's just Big event happened. And after the crowd dispersed a little bit and people settled, let's say me and two of you who were involved in the event, we get in the car, we're going to drive to Getty Square. Because we want to talk to a bunch of people down there. And when we get to Getty Square, there's already a crowd of people. What happens? 
Well, everybody else who was on the street here, they jumped in their cars and they took off to Getty Square and they started telling people about what happened. By the time we got there, everybody had knew, knew what was going on. Now, any analogy, you know, ultimately breaks down, but I think that is kind of what happened in there. So if you take a look at Luke chapter 8, and um, verse 40, says, then when Jesus returned, that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. These are people back on the other side of the lake, back in the Galilee. He came back from the gathering. And, and behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet. And he begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now you have to understand that word throng, it means pressed in. You see on the TV, on the news, you see maybe a famous candidate for president, and he's walking through a crowd, and the crowd, they're all reaching out. Have you seen that? They're trying to shake his hand and get all over there, and they're, they're pressing and, and thronging him. I won't mention any name, but this happened with one individual in particular. He loves to shake hands. I met him up in, the other night I went to the bank, we met him up in the He's not big. Big guy. Tall and big. Strong handshake. Anyway. So he, the multitude thronged him, and now here's where we pick up our story. Now a certain woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. A flow of blood for 12 years. I want you to notice her disease. She had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, what's, what, what's so important about this? Well, you got to look back at Leviticus 15 to understand really what her situation was. Look at Leviticus 15 just for a minute, please. But if you keep your place there in Luke 8, because we are going back. Leviticus 15. Now, at a certain point in the chapter, um, and I'm sorry if this sounds a little, uh, a little gross, but you know it's the word of God, right? So, at a certain point in the chapter, Moses is giving the law as to what has to happen if a man has a discharge from his body, and then when he's finished with that, he goes into for a woman, verse 19. Leviticus 15, verse 19. Now watch this. If a woman has a discharge, and the discharge is from her body, and the discharge from her body is blood, she shall be set apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean to leave. Everything that she lies on during her purity shall be unclean. Also, everything that she sits on shall be unclean. Whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean to leave. And, when, and whoever touches anything that she sat on shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and shall be able to leave it. If anything is on her bed or on anything on which she sits when he touches it, I mean, this, this is horrible, he shall be able to leave it. And if any man lies with her at all so that her purity is on him, he shall be able to leave seven days and every bed on which he lies shall be able to leave Now watch this, verse 25. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be of the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. How long did this dear lady in this passage have it? Twelve years. Twelve years. That was a disease. You know, I was I was born and raised in a uh, in what most people would consider a normal family. And 
My mother's Italian, my father's Jewish, that makes me a Jawaki. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long lost tribe, but they still exist. <laughs> and uh, we lived in the Bronx, and we had a pretty normal upbringing. I was the old four boys, and uh, I was a Cub Scout, I was in the Little League, my father went to work every day, my mother was a homemaker. It was normal. And the neighborhood started getting a little rough, so at one point, uh, when I was finishing sixth, uh, seventh grade, finishing seventh grade, not sixth grade, I'm sorry, uh, he moved, to, mom and dad decided we would move to a place called Yonkers, New York. Now at that time, I really didn't know Yonkers. They said, and I said, mom, where's Yonkers? She said, I think it's upstate. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, we moved to Yonkers. 436 Old Dell Avenue, and uh, life went on. Now by now, in seventh grade, eighth grade, uh, that time uh, in Western civilization, uh, well, in the entire world it was the mid 60s, but in Western civilization, we were experiencing the hippie uh, phenomenon. And, uh, all the teenagers were following what the rock groups did, and, and every group, and I would mention names now that would be alien to you, but the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Oh, Rolling Stones, oh, he's still singing. <laughs> See this? He has two of them. <laughs> when he sings, but anyway. Um, and as the groups, as their hair got longer, so did ours. And as their clothes got more outlandish, so did ours. And then they all started getting high, smoking pot, everything, and all my friends did. Everybody except maybe a couple guys, but mainly me. I wouldn't touch the stuff. We would drive around in the car and they'd be smoking and joining the picture, and they knew, don't even bother passing it to Billy. He's not going to take it. Just don't even waste your energy. I would love to tell you that I didn't use drugs because I was a good kid, but that would be a lie. I wanted to very badly. I wanted to do it so I could taste it. But the reason I didn't use drugs is because I remember a conversation I had overheard when I was about 10 years old, sitting on the floor of my living room. We were still living in the Bronx. And my father and my Uncle Joe, my mother's brother, my Uncle Joe, they were sitting at the kitchen table. And it wasn't a closed door. It was like a, you know, just a doorway to the kitchen table. And I was not eavesdropping on their conversation. I wasn't listening. I was watching TV. But then I heard my Uncle Joe mentioned some guy, and he said, oh, you heard about so-and-so. And my father, my father said, no, what? And I was listening, and my Uncle Joe said, oh, he, he OD'd on stuff. I was saying, I'm trying to figure out what that meant. You know, I'm 10 years old. He OD'd on stuff, right? As I was trying to process that, I heard my father, he must have leaned over my Uncle Joe, and he said in a low voice, if I ever catch my kid mess with that stuff, I'll put him in his grave. <laughs> so I said to myself, I don't know what they're talking about, but whatever it is, but if I ever catch a mess with my help, <laughs> and I ain't gonna touch it. Well, now you fast forward, you know, I'm 14, 15 years old, hanging out with my friends, I'm a big shot, I know everything. You know, 15 year olds know everything, right? And I understood by then that stuff, when my Uncle Joe mentioned it, meant heroin. And OD meant overdose. So this friend of theirs had taken a shot of heroin, it was too strong, and it killed him. But by the time I was hanging out on the street, stuff meant everything. Any drug, anything in any way, shape, or form that was an illegal drug, whether you smoked it, shot it, snorted it, Put it in your, in, your, uh, in your ears, I don't care what it was, I was not going to mess with it, period. That's it. So, I didn't do it. And one day in March of 1968, I was a sophomore in high school. I came home from school that day, I noticed my mother was very upset. I asked her what was wrong, she said, she said Daddy didn't go home on his lunch break. And as a big, as a real caring, concerned teenager, I said, look, did the other be on there? No. My father had a habit. Every day he stopped on his lunch break and called my mother. Every day. 
dinner time came and went, and you could have set your clock by my father's arrival for dinner. Whether it was a hot summer day or a cold winter night, it showed up at 5 30, 6 o'clock. My, my clock was in there. Well, dinner time came and went, and he didn't show up. Now, I didn't want my mother to catch on that I was I was starting to worry, but I was looking out the small window in the alcove, looking out at the driveway. It was about 9 o'clock at night. This big black sedan pulls into the driveway. These three guys get out, they got trench coats and hats on, and like, what is this? And they knock on the door, and they identify themselves as FBI agents. And I, the door, it didn't have a window, and I don't know how, as a 15 year old, I had the presence of mind, but I asked them if they could go to the back door and show us their ID through the glass window. And they did, they went to the back door and put their badges, and you know, I look back on that, and I say, you know, how would I be able to tell the real thing from a fake hat and dog? They showed me their idea, we let them in. And they started peppering my mother with questions. Where was your husband going when he left for work this morning? What was he wearing? What was he driving? Just throwing these questions out, left and right. And finally, my mother, and she kept answering what happened, they wouldn't tell her. Finally, my mother dug in her heels, she says, I demand that you tell me what's going on. I'm not going to answer another question unless you tell me. And I remember there were three agents there. And two of them kind of looked like uh, down. They looked like if they could be anywhere else at that point in time, they'd rather be somewhere else. But this one agent, the short guy, and he was the type of guy who looked like he just enjoyed his job. And he said, well, Mrs. Myers, there was a man this morning shot and killed trying to hold up a bank week, and he was your husband. Just like that. No compassion, nothing at all. Now, I don't know. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't normally do this, but let me ask you. Is there anybody here? And it's okay if you want to raise your hand. Is there anybody here who ever experienced the loss, not just of a loved one, of the most important person to you in your life without any warning? Has that happened to anybody? Is there a hand back there? Two, two back there. Well, God bless you. You know what I'm talking about. There's no warning, there you go, God bless you. No warning, just boom. I go from having a father who did everything with me to nothing. My mother went from having a husband who was helping her raise her four boys to nothing. She started screaming, I was trying to console her. Again, it's all a haze, but I, I somehow the terms of mind. One of the, the agents wanted one of my uncles to go with them to make a positive ID of the body. I called up my uncle Dom from the Bronx, and he, he seems like he got there in five minutes, which is not possible, but he got out there quick. And he went with one of the agents in, in, the, in the FBI's car. They left. And the whole time they were gone, I was trying to convince myself that it was all a mistake, that, that I don't know. You know, my father used to always pick up hitchhikers. Even with his family in the car, if he saw some poor soul hitchhike, he'd stop and pick him up. So I was trying to concoct this story in my mind. Okay, you know, I know what happened. Uh, Daddy was driving along and he picked up the hitchhiker, and this hitchhiker hit him over the head, took his wallet, took his ID, took his car, and that guy is the one that went to rob the bank. And they'll find Daddy somewhere. Maybe he's hurt, but they'll find him somewhere. And I'm trying to convince myself that this is what happened. And I'm staring out that window again, and after a while the sedan pulled back in, and the driver got out, and my Uncle Dom got out of the back seat, wiped his eyes with a handkerchief. And I didn't have to wait for him to get into the house, and to know right then and there that it was all true. And we found out later on from a family friend who worked with my father that my father had amassed tens of thousands of dollars of gambling debt. And the way it works, I hope none of you really know this by experience, but the way it works is that the bookies will let you bet on credit, and then if you get to a point where you can't pay, they conveniently have a, a, a business associate on the street, they call that person a Shylock or a loan shark. And that person will lend you money so you can pay back the bookie 
and the interest rates they charge it just make it almost impossible to ever catch up and pay back. And these two guys visited my father at work, and this whole conversation was overheard by a family friend. And they told him that their boss needed the money by Friday, and my father told him that he couldn't come up with that kind of money so on such short notice. And they told him, well, we know of a bank you could hit. And my father supposedly said, I can't take that chance. And they said to him, well, if you don't, we'll visit your kids on their way to school. And these were not people who made idle, empty threats. This was a, supposedly a Wednesday morning, and that Friday morning, my father left. I said goodbye, my mother said goodbye. And that's the last time I ever saw him alive. Uh, he must have had an accomplice, because they found his car in the parking lot on Tuckahoe Road, but the bank he went to hit was in Bronxville. He went into his bank in Bronxville on Pontville Road, and uh, somehow, we don't know how, but somehow the cops somehow got there so fast, and they came in from both sides, and, and, and I don't know what happened, but I know that they shot him, they died in a pool of blood on the floor there. And when my Uncle Don went to ID the body, he says he asked the, the coroner how many times he did. He said two or three. And my Uncle Don pulled back the sheets and he saw at least eight or nine bullet holes. So uh, we don't know exactly what the whole context of that is, but they killed him. And um, I was 16, a sophomore in high school. And you know, after the funeral, people come back to the house for cake and coffee and all that, and uh, I was walking around, and there were these little groups of two or three people talking, and they were saying, my mother's name is Camille, was Camille, and they were saying things like, oh, what a tragedy, and somebody else would say, yes, but at least she has Billy. At least she has Billy. Everybody thought, now Billy's going to be this big help, and he's going to be the rock. He's going to be the solid one now. I was in the car with my friends, and they were smoking the joint, so give me that. Yeah, that. Start smoking pot, and within six months, I was a mainline, full fledged heroin addict within six months, record time. And uh, that went on and on and off, methadone treatment programs and everything. Arrested 11 times over the next 12 years. Somehow, miraculously, every time I got arrested, the case was dismissed, or the prosecution lost the file, or the witness didn't show up or something. So I can stand here before you and say I have no police record here for being arrested at time, even a couple of them were felonies. No police record. In case you think I forgot about this dear lady, I want you to notice something. Her dilemma. Look at verse 43 also again, a blue date. Now I'm going to ask you to also get ready to turn to another passage. But keep your place in Luke 8, and we'll be flipping back and forth for the rest of the message. Verse 43, this woman that I followed, who told me, says, and who spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. Spent all her livelihood, that means spent all her money on doctors and couldn't be healed by any. Now look at this. Turn, please, to Mark. Chapter 5 and verse 26, no, 28. Mark 5, 28. 26, <coughs> is that say 26? Yeah, I'm sorry. Somebody who, who couldn't see put that together. <laughs> Mark 5, 26. Now Luke was a doctor, right? The beloved physician? Now, I'm not saying he withheld any information just to cover his fellow doctors. I would never imply that. But Mark adds, he had spent all her livelihood on physician and could not be healed by any. Now, watch this. Yeah, it's not going. And she suffered many things under many physicians. And... Mark says that she didn't get any better, but rather she grew worse. Twelve years, she went to every doctor she could, spent all the money she had, not only did she not get better, but she got worse. And that was my situation. Twelve years. 
in and out of these treatment programs. And every time I'd give up the methadone, I'd detox. And then when I'd go back to the heroin, I needed twice as much to get the same high. Now by this time, in mid-1981, I was doing, I was on the methadone program in the morning, but I still wanted to get high, so at night I was doing speedball. You mix heroin and cocaine, so you feel it. That's how the actor John Bougie died from that. And that was my life. That was what I was doing. And uh, I want to hear something about her dependence. In Mark, chapter 5, verse 27, notice what it says. <coughs> when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, I'll get back to her in a minute. I'm in the Parkside Diner. Some of you know where Parkside Diner is? Anybody know where Parkside Diner is? Okay. Malecon now. What's that? It's called Malecon. <laughs> no more, no longer there. It's no longer there? What, what is it now? It's an Armenian restaurant. Armenian restaurant? Dominican restaurant. Dominican restaurant. Ah, I used to know those girls, Kay Bueno and her sister, uh, <laughs> her sister, Mui Bueno. Okay. Uh, you know when you came in here, there's no cover charge, right? You, you just come in and sit down. If you come to the first meeting, there's a cover charge. But that doesn't go to the, that goes to the Lord. Anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the Parkside Diner. Yeah, we end at 1 o'clock, right? I'm in the Parkside Diner, and I'm waiting to go down the street to the corner of Radford and South Broadway and meet this guy, Carlos, I was hanging around with at the time. And we had an armed robbery plan. Now, I need to explain to you what happened with this. My brother, they all, my, my three brothers, they all followed me into drug addiction and criminal activity. I have set a great example. My brother, Danny, who's the third one down from me, uh, by this time, he was associated with, uh, with guys that talk like this and they had bent noses and they lived on Art Avenue in the Bronx. <laughs> and he fingered a, an illegal card game. He pointed it out to me. Now, this would be on one of the side streets, off Radford Street. And you would just walk, walk by the street. It looked like any other house on the block. But if you look closer, you'd see that the windows had iron grates. And, uh, just, it was a different kind of house if you look a little closer. And you would go up and knock on the door, and this is not just in the movies, this is in real life, and a little slide thing would open, and the guy would go, yeah. <laughs> and you'd have to have the parents whatever the day, you'd have to say, Fat Tony sent me, or whatever it was, you know? My brother gave me the password, and now inside this house, there would probably be six or eight of the round tables. And at each table, guys would be playing cards, dice, cards. There'd be piles of cash and jewelry on these tables. And Carlos and I, we both had guns, and we thought we we're going to go and knock on the door. Danny gave me the password. We were going to get in, and we we're going to have everybody get down on the floor. We we're going to get all the money and everything. And we we're going to leave without any consequence. This, is, this was our, what we thought. And all I can say is that God intervened, because when I left the Parkside Diner, I can remember this lady yesterday. I put my cigarette out on the sidewalk. I was about to turn to the left when I heard some noise coming from the right. Now, alongside the diner is a park. I think some brilliant planner, when they built the diner, they said, well, there's a park there. Let's call it the Park Side Diner. It's the only thing I can figure out. Or it's just a coincidence. It's the Park Side Diner, and there's a park. So I walk down the sidewalk. Those of you that have been there, you know this. I walk down the sidewalk, and I'm looking in at the park here. And I have to turn my back on you to simulate this. And over on the right side, and closer to the diner, is all the regular people from the park that I see all the time. I pass there a thousand times. Yeah, they're smoking pot, they're drinking wine from a paper sack, they're playing cards, they got some music radio going. 
and they're doing their thing. But that's not the noise that attracted me or that caused me to be interested. On the left side of the park, over here, was a group of people that stood out like a sore thumb. The ladies all dressed in nice dresses, the men had jackets and ties, and I said, this looked very strange. And they were all standing in a half circle and they had books in their hands and they were screeching, I mean, they were singing. <laughs> and I turned to leave, I said, oh, that's what it was. I turned to go, and they all sat down to music, and, and this little old man got up on a little makeshift pulpit, and he's standing up on this like soapbox thing, and he's looking at the park people. And by the way, Greg Mergian tells me recently that he built that little <laughs> that little stand that he got And he's preaching to the park people, and he's giving all he's got in heaven and hell and Jesus and the cross and sin and everything. And now I'm standing there, and I want you to put yourself there with me on the sidewalk. We're standing there looking at this guy, and then we're looking at these people, and they were just doing their thing, and it was as if there was this big brick wall between him and the people. They weren't, there was nobody paying attention to him. Not one person. So what did I do? If you knew me at the time, you, that, that Bill Myers, had no compassion for anybody. If I was on my way to get my money, or if I had my money on the way to get my drugs, if people got in my way, and I, I, I promise you I don't mean to sound like a tough guy by saying this, but when people got in our way, they got hurt. You didn't get in our way. I was on my way to get money for, 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 my, for my fix that night. But for some reason, I felt bad for this old guy. And I, I went in, and I, and I went into, I can't show you here, but I went in, there's a little bench right in front of him, and I sat on the bench, and I was pretending that I was paying attention to him, and the only thought in my mind was that if someone else walked by, they wouldn't laugh at him. Because that's what I was doing in my home. When I was standing on the sidewalk there, I was going, look at this fool. Look at this jerk. Doesn't this old man realize that there's nobody paying attention to him? <laughs> so where I go, I'm going sit down. I'm sitting there on the bench, and, and after a little while, this, this young guy comes over to me. <coughs> he stands over me, with a string in my face, which is a very dangerous thing to do in those days. <laughs> he says, aren't you Billy Myers? I look at him and I say, I don't know you. He says, yes, you do. He says, I'm Mickey the Carmine. This is the worst of son. I said, look, kid, I told you I don't know you. He says, yes, you do. He says, I went to school with your brother Danny. Well, I've already told you I had a brother Danny. I said, look, man, I told you I don't know you. Now you're starting to annoy me. And then he said the thing that really got me. Now, I neglected to tell you that after my father died, a few years went by, and my mother developed something called uh, plasma cell myeloma, a form, the rarest form of leukemia known at the time. And in 1976, she passed away. And this was 1981 that this conversation was happening on the street. And Mickey said to me, he says, my mother's Dolores. She's the lady who used to visit your mother in the hospital. Well then, you know, I remembered my mother had a friend in the war, so I figured it was okay to acknowledge who I was. So I said, yeah, I'm Billy Myers. So he sat down on the bench next to me, and he slapped me on the knee, and he said, so how are you doing? He had this big grin on his face. He was so happy, he made me sick to my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> he was grinning. He was... <laughs> so he's now, now, you know, I'm sitting there on the park bench, and he's telling me about how Jesus, see I didn't know this at the time. Let me just sidestep, but I'm gonna ask you indulgence if I go a few minutes over that 12, 15 hours, bear with me. I'll try to keep it, you know, a little reasonable, but Mickey had gone to Greenwood Hills, and there was a retreat there, and the speaker was drumming into their heads how they had to see themselves as disciples 
and they had to tell people about Jesus. So Mickey had never gone to the street meeting. For those of you who maybe have been thinking about going to the street meeting here that Bethany Chapel still runs and you haven't yet, think about Mickey's story for a minute. He had never gone to the street meeting before. They came back from this thing in Greenwood Hills and it was in his room, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Mike, in those days the street meeting was a Tuesday night, right? Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday night? So he's in his house, and he's praying, and God puts on his heart to go to the street meeting. So if, if Mickey was telling the story, because he went, he went to school with my brother Danny, so that means he's six years younger than me. If Mickey's telling the story, he says he approaches Lincoln Park, and he approaches the meeting, it's already in, in full swing, and he looks around, and there sitting on the bench is the one man who growing up in the neighborhood he used to be most afraid of. And Mickey says in, in his mind, God, you gotta be kidding me. Because <laughs> he had asked the Lord to lead him to somebody who needed to hear about him. And that's what happened. So he's on the bench with me, and he's explaining to me the love of God, Jesus. He died on the cross. The guy's still preaching on the sofa. He he had a shut up yet. He's still going. I was just glad the people weren't going to sing again. But anyway, <laughs> so M M Mickey's telling me all about it. So finally, I say, I say, Mickey, what are you doing? Because Mickey seemed normal. He had shoulder length hair. He knew about the music, the rock groups I was into. Uh, he smiled. <laughs> He, he seemed normal. So I said to him, Mickey, what are you doing out here with these people? That's when he got real excited. He jumped off the bench and he said, I'm a disciple. <laughs> I was raised Catholic. And I said, look, I don't know much about the Bible. I know there's only 12 disciples. They all died a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean you're a disciple? He said, no, it just means a follower of Jesus. Oh, okay, right. And then... And then I start getting mad at him. <laughs> then if you're Jesus, he loves me, you tell me God loves me. Then where was your Jesus when my father was bleeding to death on the floor of that bank? Huh, Mickey? Tell me where and I, I used language to him that even when I used to speak in the New Hampshire State Prison, I couldn't even use that language to those guys. I certainly wouldn't use it to you when I spoke to you this morning. So just, I guess you have to let you imagine, where was your faith in God and Jesus? When my father, God loves me, Jesus? Where was your faith in blank God of love when my mother was in the hospital? She was, she was in so much pain, they were giving her so much morphine, she was hallucinating. Where was your God of love? I think he said, look, Bill, he says, I, I don't have all the answers, which is very instructive, because sometimes as Christians, we think we have to have all the answers, and we don't. He says, I don't have all the answers, but I do know this, that sometimes God has to let people get in the lowest position for their right look for them. And I looked in. It's a lot of you. That's nice. If, if this is helpful for you, and how many times these words have come back for me, if this is helpful for you in your life, then that's great, but, you know, it's not for me. So, I think he said, no. Just say you'll come to the meeting on Sunday morning. And I, I said, well, where is he? He says, it's up on Greenville Avenue, in, 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 up in the North End. I said, now, well, my car, my car's not working. He says, he says, that's all right, I'll pick you up. I said, well, I, I don't have anything appropriate to wear. He said, well, yeah, well, it's fine. Just say you'll go. I said, oh, okay, hello. Never dreamed in a million years he'd pick me up on Sunday morning at my apartment in South York, because I had a little old Sicilian landmate, and it was Mr. Sacco, and at about, Nine o'clock on Sunday morning, she calls upstairs and says, Bill, this is somebody here for you. I said, Oh, yeah, Miss Sackle, tell him I'll be right down. She says, Where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. She says, I asking you, where are you going? <laughs> she, she didn't believe me I was going to church. She <laughs> observed my coming and going. And we got in this car, and I remember not having a dime in my pocket that day. I wasn't, didn't know where I was going to have lunch. And I had already tapped out every eating establishment in South Yonkers. I said, hey, Joe, give me a sandwich. I'll pay you one second. I just, I couldn't show, show my face anywhere. And we come up, and we're walking in. 
and we get in the first set of doors, and being raised a good Catholic, my hand automatically curled, ready for the holy water, and I almost stumbled because there was none. And I'm looking around, and there were no statues, no stained glass. When are you folks going to get some stained glass? No. No, <laughs> no stained glass. Everything that I was familiar with when you think of church was absent. I said, hey, Mickey, I, I, said, I thought you said we're going to church. He says, no, no. He says, we're the church. This is just the, the chapel. I said, first this guy's a disciple. Now he's the whole church. <laughs> And we went in and sat down, and I sat in what I call the escape seat, right back there in the corner. <laughs> I can't see who's sitting there, but whoever is, raise your hand, raise your hand. No, 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 in the pews, the last seat, there you go. Who is that? That's where I sat. He says, what do you want to sit back here for? You want to go? I said, well, in case. In case I wanted to go out for smoke, I didn't want to disturb anybody. The real reason was in case I I wanted to split. I just didn't want anybody stopping me. I just wanted to be able to get out of there. And a brother was preaching that Sunday. And he was going on and on again about heaven and hell and sin and the cross and Satan and God and forgiveness. And I remember sitting back there. And all my various fundraising activities over the last four years were flowing through my mind. Horrible scenes, even scenes where people got there, and just everything. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, even if what this guy is saying is true, there's no way that God could forgive a person who's done the kind of things that I've done. And as I was having that thought, the speaker leaned at this pulpit, right? This actual pulpit, right here. He leaned over. He's a tall guy, and he leaned over, and he looked out, and this is what he said. He said, friend, you're sitting here right now thinking that you're too bad for God to forgive, but you're wrong, my friend. And I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. And my whole vocabulary at the time was the word wow. <laughs> and as quickly as I had that thought, he said, oh. I know what happened. Boy, these people are pretty slick. They thought they were going to pull an over on old Willie Boy. This kid, Mickey, after Wednesday night, when I met him, he must have called the preacher and said, hey, listen, I'm bringing this guy. He's really bad. He's a big drug dealer. His name's Bill Myers. So don't look right at him, but say something so he'll think that God is true and he'll become a believer. Do you think, that, you think that's what happened? But he never called me. Uh, check this out. It was the Holy Spirit who resided inside this preacher, putting the right words in his heart and making them come out of his mouth just at the right time. At the same time, convicting me of sin of righteousness and judgment. But then what happened is that I'm having, oh man, these people are there slip. The birds of the air came and tried to pluck away the seed. So after the meeting's over, Mike introduces me to his dad, Big Mike Carmine. I'm sorry that some of you never got to know Mike. He's with the Lord now. And uh, you can come out and just say, heard Mike. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you doing? Come over and have lunch with us. Lunch? <laughs> <laughs> and he introduced me to his mother, Dolores. He says, oh, I remember you. You were the bad one. <laughs> Thank you, my mind. I love you too. <laughs> we went to that house, had a lovely meal. I should have known something was up. You know, a, a, a poet from the previous century, his name was Cooper, I believe, wrote a poem called The Hound of Honey. Is it Cooper? No? He wrote The Hound of Heaven. And it starts out, I fled him down the years. I fled him down the labyrinth way. The hound of heaven is after this guy. And if the hound of heaven is after you, uh, you could run, but you can't hide. 
And I should have known something was up because during the uh, after we were sitting in the living room, and I asked the Lord for glasses and glasses, so you can get yourself away with the glasses are right in the, uh, in the, the cover of the shelf. And I don't know if you remember this, but I, I went in, I was getting glass of water, and the sun was shining, and on the knickknack shelf was a ring. I guess she had taken it off through the dishes or something, there's a ring sent there. <laughs> now, in my mind, I'm going, okay, just take it down, put it in my pocket, go back in the room, sit down, and wait about 10 minutes, and then say, oh, you know, I just remember, I've got a, my, my camel has to be watered as well. <laughs> And I tried to take that stinking ring and I couldn't take it. Could not take it. Went back in, sat down, I had more conversation. It was getting towards supper time and I, I, I needed to go because I had to do things. And I'm halfway out the door and I turn away to Dubai and Mike was sitting in his big chair, me and the Sunday came and down and said, I want to ask you something before you go. So what's that, Mike? You get hit by a truck tonight and die, where are you going? Going. Now, believe it or not, a person in my situation, as messed up as I was, you could still be a prideful person. And I prided myself on being very well read. I used to read everything I get my hands up. And the last thing in the world I wanted was for the big Mike to think that I didn't understand his message, that I didn't get it. So I went halfway back to him and I said, Mike, you know, I, I, I understand what you're trying to tell me. According to what you tell me, if I if I die tonight, I would go to hell. I, I understand that, Mike. I don't believe it, but I understand it. I turned to go. This is what he did. He picked up his newspaper. And before he did it, he went like this. He said, "Son, he says, take a hike. I told you the truth. Now you got to do it." He picked up his newspaper and started reading it. Now I don't recommend that as an evangelistic <laughs> But you know what? In my case. That's what the Lord used because it, I'm convinced if it had been uh, a dear, sweet, little old lady, grandmotherly type saying, well, wait, sonny, don't go, I would have been gone. But Mike, with this attitude, I found myself back in the living room just trying to make peace and leave on a good note. And Mickey put an old Bible in my hand and told me just read it anywhere. And, and the only promise they extracted for me is that I would show up at the next street meeting Wednesday night. So I said I would go, and I did. You know, I've got out this lady, and I'm home okay. All right. I want you to notice this in Mark 5 29. It says, She touched the hem of his garment. Mark 5 29. And immediately, immediately, a flow of blood. <coughs> dried up, and she felt in her body. Now look at this. Immediately, her cure was sudden. Right then and there, like that, right on the spot. Sudden. Her flow of blood dried up. It was complete. In Colossians chapter 1, I believe it's verse 19, you can check me later. The Apostle tells us, you are complete in Him. You need not go find a second blessing. You need not go find some other uh, spiritual experience. To have, oh, I, I trusted Christ, but I also need to uh, be baptized, or I also need to speak in tongues, or I also need to, wherever. And some churches teach this. And if you haven't had that experience, you, you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. But that's not what the Word of God says. You are complete in Him. So she felt in her body that it was dried up. She enjoyed it. You know what, folks? It's okay to enjoy being saved. You don't have to, as a proof of your spirituality, walk around like you've been sucking on women. <laughs> you folks are sitting. You're laughing now. You're smiling. You're sitting. The next Sunday, I come to Bethany Chapel. This young preacher, fellow's name was Cracker, something, something, Cracker. <laughs> Cracker. Oh, Philly Cracker. Yes. Yeah, remember him? Yeah. He's old now, but he was a young preacher back then. 
<laughs> and uh, he was preaching, and after the meeting was over, they all said, we're going to have a picnic up on the, the campus grounds of, of King's College. I said, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and on the way up there, I remember thinking about his sermon. He was preaching, I don't know if Billy, if you remember this, he was preaching from a passage where Moses gave the prescription for cleansing leprosy, and you, you had two birds, and you killed one and dipped the other in its blood, and you let fly away. Remember that? <laughs> I do. I remember on the way up there, thinking that he made a mistake in his message. Now, I wasn't saved yet. And we, we pull up there, everybody's getting out of the cars, and they see some of the men and ladies just setting up all the stuff, the grills going, they're setting up the hot dog, everything they're doing, and there's the preacher standing in the midst of everybody. And I remember saying, I need to go talk to this guy. I was going to play, let's go beat up the preacher, because <laughs> I was going to correct him. So I had just read that passage this morning. Anyway, so I went up to him and I started talking, muttering, whatever I was saying. And he looked at me, he was very patient, he looked at me, kind of like when a dog is trying to understand this <laughs> crazy person. And he said, have you, have you accepted the Lord yet? I said, well, no, not really. I didn't know what to pray. He said, well, why don't you pray right now? And I said, right here for all these people. He said, well, if it make you more comfortable, you can step into the bushes and bushes with this high. <laughs> and we, we stepped over into these bushes. <laughs> and for some reason, I felt better. I don't know. <laughs> and he led me in prayer, and he was very, very careful to explain to me that it was not me repeating his words, that's not what saved me, but that as I was praying, if I believed what I was saying, then I would have the free gift of eternal life. The only thing I knew at the time was I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't know anything about I was going to have to cut my hair or stop this or anything. I knew nothing of that. His Lordship salvation is a crop that people push that. That you have to understand every, every ramification of what it means before you trust the Lord. No. July 19th, 1981, a couple days from now, is my spiritual birthday. The reason I know the, remember the date is because the next day was my actual birthday. And the, the Carmine family had a small birthday party for me. And I still have to this day a little Bible, Greg and Aaron Mergey, signed the inside of the Bible, and they gave me this Bible. It was the first birthday party I had in years. And that's the day I was saved. And I knew it happened immediately, and I knew that I was complete in Jesus Christ, and it felt great. Let me tell you. One more thing. I know we're over, so please bear with me. And we'll go go well real soon. Her duty. Look at in Luke 8, verse 47. Now here's where you're going to need to keep the Mark passage open and the Luke passage. Very interesting. In Luke 47, 847 says she declared them in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched them and how she was healed immediately. Now, you have to understand, a few verses before that, I, I mean, he looks around and says, Who touched me? Right? Who touched me? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the critics who try to say the Bible has errors, or they try to say that Jesus is not God, they use this passage as one of the proofs. See, they say. He said, who touched me? If he was omniscient, knowing everything, he certainly would have known. But if you flip over to the Mark passage, And look at Mark 5, I want to say 30, I'm not sure, but, but it's, he says he touched me, and then it says this, when he looked around to see her who had touched him. He looked around to see her who had touched him. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, and he flipped back and Luke, 
I knew that the Luke passage, verse 46, I believe, when she saw that she was not hidden. So in other words, he looks around to see the woman, he knew who it was, and she saw him when she when she saw him see her, when she when she saw when he saw, you know, <laughs> what I'm trying to say? She knew, oh, he knows it's me. And then you have this. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And from that day to now, I have tried my best to declare to all the people the reason Jesus touched me and how I was healed immediately. And you could look at the chain. Look at the, the folks down at Greenwood Hills having their conference and having a speaker, and the speaker is impressing on the mind of this young man that he's got to be a disciple, he's got to tell people. And the young man comes home and prays, Lord, leave me some ideas. And the good folks at Bethany Chapel are doing a street meeting for a gazillion years. I don't know how long you've been doing it, like 240 years, right? <laughs> and, and, and they were there before there was a park or before there was a diamond. No. And, and, and they're doing the street meeting faithfully, and God engineers all these circumstances to come together. And he has me go through everything I went through in life, so I'd be primed at that moment. That's what God can do. That's the power of God's love, the power of his salvation. Uh, we don't have time to tell you how I, I got off the drugs, uh, Again, the Virgin, the Virgin family, Greg, was very helpful in my early days of salvation. Joe Irving from the chapel gave me my first job. Uh, Mike, the colonized family, took me to Greenwood Hills where I did cold turkey on my habit. There's just not enough time to tell you everything, but it's God. Yeah, you know, I tell the story, we have a few laughs, you know, have a few smiles, but ultimately it's God. It's the power of God. It's the power of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross to unshackle anybody who cares to. I don't know you all now, but if there's even one person sitting here right now, maybe you've come for several weeks, several months, maybe you've come with a relative, maybe you, you've come just because you think it's the right thing to do. But if you know in your heart that you've never yielded to Jesus Christ as Savior, that is the first step. You just simply have to pray and ask God to forgive your sins. You don't even have to list them all and tell him you believe he died on the cross for your sins and the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the work here at Bethany exists and that you have paved the way for countless people to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ going back to the days of the James Slip Mission down in Manhattan, the Yonkers Gospel Mission here, the street meeting, whatever other outreaches. Lord, thank you for that. And we just pray that we would continue to be faithful to your word. And that we commit this day to you now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.